Good afternoon, um, and thank you for joining us today for this session. Um, before we jump into the session, I, I would like to just say that um, I'm really, really honored to have all of these people here, and I'm really thankful that you, you all have taken the time to attend this session today. I hope you all had lunch, because we rushed. <laughs> um, three years ago, when I started the job at Zamane Media, by the way, this is Sudeshna from Zamane Media. Three years ago when I started there, I had no idea that the word exile and media went together. I had no idea that there was an entire landscape of exile media outlets that existed. And then I started working there and I learned that we're not the only ones, we're not the only region that has exile media outlets and that there's an entire landscape of um, newsrooms that, that operate in exile. And therefore, we, we, we met, we have different connections through which we, we've all met each other, and eventually this opportunity came along and we were thinking of, of, uh, of a session. And we thought, for, for now, just as a working title, let's go with Exile Media is not a trend, because it's not. And eventually, when, when we when we've flushed out the idea of what this session should be, we'll think of a better title. But then eventually, uh, as time went by, we, we started realizing that there is a lot of truth in that, in that working title that we'd come up with, Exile Media is not a trend, because it's not. Uh, here at this panel alone, we have decades of Exile Media history sitting here among us. I would like to start in, in this order with a little bit of history of who we are, um, how long we've been doing this for, and who, who you are, so Ivan. Yeah, hi. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Ivan Kalpakov. I am editor-in-chief and co-founder of Medusa. Uh, Medusa was launched uh, in 2013 in Riga, Latvia. Uh, this is an international Russian-speaking media organization. It was the first among many Russian uh, media outlets based outside of the country. And now it is the biggest uh, independent Russian-speaking uh, media organization that still has millions of readers within the country. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Mambreño, and I work at Confidencial. Confidencial is an independent news media outlet from Nicaragua in Central America. We've been around for 27 years, and in 2019, we were raided by the government. Um, we went into exile, came back again, thinking things were gonna be better, but truth is, it didn't. So we uh, went into exile for a second time um, in, 2009, in 2021, and we have been scattered ever since, depending on where the people have chosen to be in exile. Um, so we are a fully remote newsroom uh, trying to making things work. So we have a website, we have a very successful YouTube channel, newsletters, and we're serving Nicaraguans uh, in Nicaragua, but also the migrant community that has uh, emigrated to different regions, uh, different countries uh, in Latin America and other parts of the world. Hello, I'm uh, Ule Chavon. I'm a, a media developer at the Democratic Voice of Burma, already for 15 years now. Uh, the Democratic Voice of Burma is uh, 31 years old now, so that is uh, certainly not a trend. Um, it, is, uh, it, it, it started out as an exile media, uh, and then when Burma or Myanmar, it's the same, uh, opened up with the Aung San Suu Kyi being released, we moved in, and then unfortunately, uh, in 2021, there was a military coup and we had to uh, move out again. Uh, actually, moving out and there's still, uh, DVB has the, the biggest underground network of uh, journalists and uh, we're making television and uh, 
online news and podcasts 24-7, uh, uh, reaching about 20 million people a week. So. And hi, uh, my name is Matt Casper. Uh, I'm co-director of the Association for Democracy, which is a Berlin uh, NGO that runs uh, two media projects, Medan TV and Rome. Um, here representing my Medan TV uh, today, and in fact, I'm a publisher at Medan TV. I've been there for about five years. Uh, Medan will be about 10 years old in a couple weeks. Uh, it is Azerbaijan's largest media outlet. It's, it's also its then largest independent media outlet. Um, we have we were born in exile, so to speak. So founded in Berlin uh, in 2013, and uh, but work with our audience and most of our journalists based inside the country. Um, we are a daily, we're covering national news and the regional news as well, kind of with a lot of focus on, on video content, so. Thanks. And hello, I'm, I'm Sudeshna, Sudeshna Chanda from Zamani Media, which is a Persian language exile media outlet based in Amsterdam. We've been operational for the last 18 years. We were initially established as a radio, uh, as radio and uh, e eventually migrated into the digital space we've been permanently censored in iran right from the from the from the beginning but uh, as radio we were also censored and then since we moved on into the digital platform we've also been been censored which is also why in the past few years we've experimented a lot with censorship circumvention technologies what can media publishers do towards making news available to in, in censored environment and how do we work with technologists uh, in doing so. So, thank you. But now that we're talking about exile media, I suppose there is a question of what is exile, especially in, in today's context, in such a, in this, like, there's digital, there's like physical exile. So, Matt, what, what, how, how would you define exile in the context of media today? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so since we're talking about exiled media and there's a lot of connotations that come with it, we thought uh, in a very kind of like master's thesis style, we should define what it is before we start the rest of the discussion. Um, and in reality, I think that there is no, um, there's no kind of cookie cutter definition for what an exiled media is. Um, I was trying to think of how to explain that um, because a lot of the, when you even hear the word exile, it has these connotations, it's very negative. Um, you think of kind of people who may have been in exile, historical figures, so there's always kind of this kind of depressing story um, where someone's completely cut off um, from their home and, uh, and it doesn't take into consideration the kind of the digital world that we live in today and, and, and how, how actually unrealistic that would be today for most people in exile and most outlets in exile. Um, that it's very hybrid, that it's transnational, that there's a lot, hap there's a lot, most exiled outlets work with people in the countries that they're working in. So a lot of the times their journalists are not even maybe all in exile themselves, uh, working underground. Um, and, and I was trying to think of exactly, you know, how, how to give kind of an example of why that becomes a problem um, when we don't think kind of bigger and understand when we say exiled media. Um, I can say that when, we, when I try to talk about Maidan to people, they often, um, that one of the questions they're always going to ask first is, um, you know, uh, where is your audience based? Is it based inside the country? And I think there's this conception when you say exiled media, immediately that um, it's for an exiled audience. And that might be the case, but most of the time it's actually not the case. And I think we have, you know, just here are five different examples of how um, we're, we're all, I mean, our audience focus and our focus on our, uh, and the focus of our, our content and where many of our journalists are based is inside the countries um, speaking to those audiences. Um, and so uh, I would say, you know, on one hand, we are exiled outlets. On the other hand, we also don't always have to be. Um, I think my journalists, I was talking with my journalists uh, recently about exiled media again, and they said, we aren't an exiled media because, in effect, most of our team is in Azerbaijan and our audience is in Azerbaijan and we're speaking to Azerbaijanis. Um, on the other hand, we are in exile because we're officially based somewhere else for security reasons. So um, I think it's just more about, uh, I think that we are all, rep we all represent kind of the diversity. There's a lot of common themes between our outlets, but also differences and in going into, starting in the country, then going in, leaving, then going back, or starting out, going in, going out. Um, so it's just to kind of, there's no one size fit all kind of, kind of uh, definition, but it's more just about saying, okay, 
the exiled media is in its sense, it's media first, um, and it's exiled second. So um, yeah, that's how I would put it. Thanks, Matt. Um, well, you've, you've explained the exile of media very well, but there's also this identity question for exiled journalists or individuals who have gone into exile. And with that, I'd like to ask Cynthia, um, how, do you, how do you see this identity, this dichotomy of being a journalist, but also having gone into exile, that, the, the role of activism? And, and how do you see that, that play into uh, the, the psyche or, or, or how journalists or individuals who go into exile see themselves eventually? I mean, I think it's, a, it's a, an important question, but also a tricky one, because at least in Nicaragua, when the political crisis started, not only we were witnessing history, we were participating in history, but we're also being victims of uh, raids or um, uh, harassment by the government or uh, espionage, etc. So sometimes just emotionally it is very difficult because you're going through a very tense moment that leads to trauma to even separate um, you know, your coverage from um, from your personal life, especially if you're working and then you have the police outside your house. Or if you're working and, and then you are suddenly told, you know, you have to leave because it is not safe um, to be doing your work and, and you have to relocate to another country. So I think that uh, in our case, it has been very useful to have editors, like editors who have also been in exile before, like Carlos Fernando, our director, who's like the light. When he sees that we're maybe, you know, getting too overwhelmed, like we have these conversations in which he reminds us, you know, that we are here to tell people what is happening. We are here to record the first draft of history and we are here even in, with a vision, you know, when people are gonna read what happened in 2018 in Nicaragua, this is what happened, it doesn't have an opinion, it's just the facts. So that helps you just have some better uh, perspective on what you're doing and getting back to getting on track. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Ivan, um, also a similar question. How would an editor in that case uh, deal with this, this dichotomy because Clearly, it helps journalists when their editor is able to make that difference, but how does an editor make that difference for themselves if they've also gone into exile? Well, um, it's really, it's, it's, it's a one million dollars question. And uh, um, of course, it's really hard to be objective uh, when you are in a very vulnerable situation. and. Uh, a lot of journalists in exile, they are basically uh, refugees. They lost their home. They were harassed um, at home. And um, um, they are people in need. They need support themselves. So, of course, you're losing your objectivity. But there is another very important question, uh, and this question is relevance. How can you judge, uh, you know, being outside of the country? And... Um, Mm, I think um, when you live somewhere else, um, over the years, you get this split identity. Like you are here, but you are also there all the time. Or you are neither here nor there, uh, which is also the case uh, in many situations, unfortunately. But I don't think that it, it is necessarily bad. Uh, because in my experience, it makes you more sensitive, uh, makes you more open-minded, and uh, for editors, sometimes it's really great. Um, but we, let's return to the relevance. Um, I think that um, the only way you can remain relevant is um, you need to have people on the ground, even if you are completely in exile. Uh, for example, Medusa now has a network of freelancers in uh, Russia. Uh, we call them proxy reporters or guerrilla reporters. There are strict rules how they are work. Um, 
And um, since we are labeled as an undesirable organization, it means that we are legally forbidden in Russia. It is actually, you can't interact with Medusa anyhow. You can't provide comments, you can't work for Medusa, uh, you can't financially support Medusa, you can be fined, and then you can go to prison. Uh, so these people, these freelancers, they are working in, you know, in an extremely dangerous environment. And uh, we always forget about it. When we talk about this you know, industry of uh, media in exile, we all have to remember about the freelancers on the ground, about the people on the ground. We all rely on them, and I think they are real heroes of our part of you know, profession. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, moving on from the editorial side of an exile media outlet, uh, I'd also like to ask you, Ulla, about the the sustainability of an exile media outlet. Like, how how do you make it a sustainable? Like, how do you work towards the sustainability of an exile media outlet, especially with um, with so much funding uh, available for exile media now? Is there a lot of funding available for exile media now? Please tell us. Where? Where? <laughs> no. I, f I forgot to mention in my introduction actually that, that I'm sorry, that, that uh, yeah, also the reason why we are in exile again is that uh, uh, seven reporters of DVB got arrested since the coup and, uh, and uh, two of them are still in, uh, in prison as we speak, being tortured every night. So there's a really good reason why all of us are, are doing this complicated work, I think, uh, like you said, we're you know, out of respect and uh, for the, the people that are doing the really dangerous work inside uh, these countries. Uh, but how to, how to make it sustainable? Yeah, that, that is you know, one of the, the difficult questions, but you know, somehow like DVB, uh, we managed for, for 30 years, thanks to several very loyal and generous donors. But it is very difficult, uh, and that is, yeah, I think one of the things with, with independent media is that uh, there's, it happens quite, quite a lot of times that donors are happy to fund uh, DVB, but then they want to push some kind of uh, topic, uh, very often great topics like uh, gender equality or environment or health. But that's the whole thing about independent media. Of course, I, I guess I don't have to explain you, but you know, there's, there's only the editor in chief that is in charge that day actually makes the call what is gonna be in the headlines of that day and nobody else. And uh, of course we do also cover those topics, but nobody, is telling us what to do. So convincing donors of that independence and that they cannot tell us uh, what the news should be about, but just you know, support the operation, that is sometimes uh, pretty difficult. But uh, yeah, we, we, we manage. And uh, I think also um, yeah, that's, that's why it's really nice to, to uh, work with you guys and also exchange this kind of lessons and tips and tricks on, on how to get, get uh, enough funding to be uh, sustainable. Thank you. And Matt, what has your experience been with Medan TV and, and funding, yeah. working with donors especially? Right. Um, so uh, Medan TV is, is, is donor funded uh, for the most part. It's actually, I mean, it's not the ideal situation, right? Um, you wanna be funded by your audience if you can be. Um, and that's, the, it, there's so many difficulties that are I think, exp expounded, expanded by being in exile is that you then have all these lo logistical difficulties, legal difficulties, um, or even simply like operating costs that, you know, um, if your office is in, uh, is in, con in the, in Azerbaijan, for example, it's not as expensive as an office in Berlin. So you have like extra costs, um, that you have to also kind of uh, cover. So you're, you're kind of fighting in one way, you have less opportunities to, to um, be supported by your audience, um, but m more costs <laughs> at the same time. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be here to complain <laughs> about, um, about uh, our relationships with donors or, or this or that, but I do think one thing that is important is that, um, and something that has been a, I would say is, 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 a, is this is a call then to those who might be able to me mediate on this, is the rea reality of the, the environments that we're working in. So these are, these are I mean, 
pretty much there are anything from dictatorships to authoritarian regimes or whatever you want to call them. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to work there. And um, the kind of expectations, I think, sometimes from donors when it comes to like the bureaucracy that is needed, um, it's pushed to kind of pass the buck is passed down onto us. And also the responsibility and the liability and all of this is passed down onto us. And um, our journalists are taking the risks there. They're taking the liabilities. They accept the liabilities. They accept what's going on and what risk they're at. Um, but I mean, sometimes it almost becomes suffocating. It, it, it hinders your ability to work um, when you are kind of being, it, it's a, the smaller the grant, the more, the more administrative work there is. Um, and I prefer, you know, uh, to, to hire more journalists and, and, and not have, you know, 30 administrative uh, people in the team. I mean, you know, you wanna, you wanna get the money to where it's going, um, but you also have to get the paperwork done. So I think this is something that, um, it seems I personally have in the last five years seen it get more and more bureaucratic, so that's a problem. You, you work on it, but I also think that we're all organizations that have existed for a while, have systems on how to work with this, are, have, are, have developed and, and, and have experience. So think about then smaller organizations, newer organizations, people newly in exile. Um, it makes it even more difficult for them because uh, this, this basis is not, is not there in their organizations. Um, and the, the, the focus should just be really on providing support um, for the, one, for journalism, yeah, it's, it's not just a, pro, it's not a trend, it's also not a project, um, but also uh, being realistic about, you know, um, understand, I think just having a bit of understanding for the environment that you're working in, yeah. yeah. Thanks. But you, all, you also raised a very uh, good point about being able to, the audience being able to support you, mm -hmm. which is often, at least we think uh, that it's not possible because of our, of our distance from our audiences or the environment that our audiences are in. Um, like I know when I started working at Zamani Media and we were, we were really interested in, in launching some sort of a membership model or some sort of an audience relationship model, and uh, I spent months on end doing research on this and there was just absolutely nothing other than very, uh, because a lot of times the resources that are available uh, online are often tailored to traditional media outlets who are in close proximity with their audiences or who have, who do not have to deal with the security concerns that we have to deal with. Uh, but only very recently I found out that both Medusa and Confidential have been working with their audiences for a few years now and they have some really interesting experiences but also some really interesting takeaways in terms of the value that Exile Media adds to this, to the news landscape, the value that Exile Media adds to the lives of these people. Um, and I, I would love to hear from both uh, Cynthia and Ivan. I know there are what I found very interesting, and you will get into this in a bit, is uh, in Cynthia's experiences, I've heard these really hyper-local cases of value addition from an exile media outlet, and in, from, from Ivan, I've heard of these global cases of, of how Medusa is, is adding towards the, towards the news landscape. So I'd like to hear from the two of you, and I'm sure we would. My favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, before the political crisis started in Nicaragua, um, there was a sentiment about journalism being uncomfortable, journalism being uh, nagging, let's say. So um, we were publishing our investigations and we didn't see things really happening. Like, what's the impact? Do people care? How do I know if I care? So when, the, when, the, when we had the crisis and we were raided and we had to go into exile, etc., we were, a few months before, we were afraid of, of, of launching a campaign because you think, what are people going to say? Like, we're asking for money. I mean, you, you get really uncomfortable because it's out of your comfort zone. You have a business model who worked for decades differently. Um, and so we had no, no advertising. We had no building. We had no home. So we said, you know, what the heck? So we're going to launch um, a, a donation campaign, and we're going to say the situation is this one. 
please help us. Also, we only accept payments through PayPal, so could you please learn how to make a PayPal payment? <laughs> it, was, it was really nerve-wracking. And we, I mean, the overflow of help, I have to tell you guys, I have cried. Because this is the first time that I, that I see that people like call, they say, I don't know how to make a payment, can you teach me? I mean, I taught people how to make online payments. Um, or I don't wanna make a ban bank payment, can I send it to someone, someone? Or I don't know how to make a payment online, how do I do it? People have traveled 30 minutes, an hour from remote areas to make a bank deposit. And you think, how is this happening? <laughs> you didn't, because you measured support through traffic and traffic is an indicator, but when people show up, then you think, I do have a community, and I do have um, people who say, when you're in trouble, or even if you're not in trouble, when things are kind of okay, we'll be here for when you need it. So I think that's one of the most humbling experiences that I've had running a membership program and also our newsroom, to feel that we're actually not alone in the ecosystem, but not alone in Nicaragua and not alone. In our in our project, um, I also cried many times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of finances, um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, Medusa is also like confidential. We had this experience. We used to be a commercial company uh, years ago. Uh, we had a business model. Um, um, it was constructed around native advertising. We had very successful native advertising in Moscow. We were based outside of the country, but we had an agency within the country. And uh, in 2021, we were labeled as a foreign agent, and it was, you know, it was a, a massive event. Uh, now everyone is foreign, every good person in, in Russia, as you know, is foreign agent. But in 2021, it was something new, and we were the first uh, big uh, media organization that was labeled as a foreign agent. And the whole business model crashed in one week. We lost 90% of our advertisers, and we cried. And we actually thought that we need to shut down the operation. We were seriously considered that. And, um, but we decided to try, you know, to, we, tr we decided to try crowdfunding. Uh, we were super skeptical in the beginning. We thought that we're gonna collect, you know, money for two months, uh, and during, you know, these two months, we will find, you know, another serious, some substantial sources of uh, money. Uh, but it turned out that, you know, you can, uh, if you are the biggest media uh, on the market, you can feed yourself through crowdfunding. It was a huge campaign of support in the parallel. So it was not only, it was about community in so many ways. And, um, you know, it's, it, it was really great. One of the great moments, I guess, in, in, in the history of our media organization, because normally journalists uh, don't get a lot of support from their, uh, from the readership. And when you, you are, you know, when you get that amount of love, wow, that's great. Um, year later, however, Russia uh, started the war with Ukraine and our crowdfunding, and we thought, okay, this is the end of crowdfunding. Either this side or the other side, somehow it will crush. And it, it of course, it uh, was destroyed, uh, but this time it was, it was destroyed by uh, the Western sanctions. Uh, we just could not get money, we could not transfer money from Russia to Europe. Um, and also, it felt that, you know, they're gonna punish people for financing Medusa at some point, so we just, we decided to stop crowdfunding in Russia. And it was also a dramatic moment because uh, it was the beginning of the war, and we were really focused on the war coverage, and we have evacuated everyone from Russia, like third part of our team was based in Russia at the moment, uh, back then. And, uh, and also our crowdfunding was completely destroyed. 
So, and our, like, our financial model was destroyed for the second time in one year. Uh, we didn't cry. We didn't have time to cry. Uh, but we started new crowdfunding with the support of the uh, um, international community of journalists. We started international crowdfunding. And it, it actually works. Uh, we have replaced, uh, uh, we almost replaced the um, source, you know, the source of money that uh, came from Russia, uh, thanks to our friends in Germany, hi Leon, and uh, in other European countries in the United States. Um, and it's great. I mean, um, international crowdfunding works because people want to participate. And uh, what is great about crowdfunding, you sit on your sofa uh, uh, and you actually, you pay 10 euros to Medusa, for example, and you are a hero. <laughs> and that's great, you are changing something. And for many people, uh, I, I understand that a uh, huge part of our crowdfunding now, um, you know, it's people from media or it's people from the civil, from human rights um, uh, movement. They understand why it is important to keep, you know, providing independent information in Russia, even after 24th of February. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks, thank you, Ivan, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, what I find fascinating about all of this is these are such inspiring stories, but it, in the entire time that I was doing research on reader revenue, on membership, on revenue diversification, I never came across these stories. And I feel like that's also, that's, that's also something that we, we felt, we all felt in our own spaces that was lacking in the community and that was the community. Like for the longest time, I, I still, I don't know if any of us knows how many Exile Media outlets are actually out there. Um, we, we got in touch in different occasions for different reasons and we still had to introduce one to another because they had no idea. So while there are so many Exile Media outlets, and, and I say that because just here, just in, in two cities, from two cities in, in Western Europe, we've, we've had five of us here. Uh, so I can only imagine how many other Exile Media outlets are out there. But there's no space, or there was the, we felt that there was the space lacking to share this knowledge. I spent months on end doing research on different things which I later found out Matt was good at, or Cynthia was good at, or Ula was good at, or Ivan was good at. Zamane Media has developed publisher-centric censorship circumvention tools or is working on it, but how many of us know about it? And, and how many of us would benefit from it, uh, and by us I mean media outlets, if we just knew, if we just knew who to reach out to. But also if we just had a space where we can just do this, get on a call and complain about work, <laughs> about, about that colleague that I can't complain to my, my manager about. I need someone to complain to about. <laughs> <laughs> but the, that, was, that, was the, that was the space that was my, my colleagues are now intrigued who this person is. <laughs> um, but that's what we felt was lacking. And um, I remember it was in 2021, one November evening, Cynthia and I were having coffee. Uh, and I just wanted to learn about her membership work. And we said, well, why not? Why not do something which brings the community together, which creates a safe space for people to share, to get, to also get excited about what we're doing because we're doing really cool stuff. We're doing a very important work and we're doing it really well. So, um, and, I, and, and Cynthia said something that has stayed with me since. I'm not quit, I'm trying to do justice to what you had said. Um, she'd said that, uh, well, two things. One uh, was, where do dictators learn from? They learn from each other. They learn from each other to how to oppress, how to repress us. Why shouldn't we do the same? Why don't we learn from each other in how to stand up against repression? And she'd also said, and where do journalists complain about their work? It's not in front of their computers. It's not in the editorial room. It's at a bar. 
it's at a cafe. And we don't have those bars and those cafes. We don't have those spaces that are safe, that are for exiled media outlets. And therefore, we are here. <laughs> um, Cynthia, do you want to talk about it? <laughs> do the unveiling? I was not ready for this question, but. <laughs> um, I just think that when you go into exile, you feel like you're inventing the wheel. And you don't have anybody to go to. I mean, you, you have some contacts, but it's not that you have a map of or, or a space to talk to other colleagues in which someone says, well, you know what? There's a better way of doing that. Or there's a faster way of, of getting up your legal framework and where to go, how to get lawyers. Because it's not only, I mean, of course, the nature of the media outlets to make news, but there's an operation. And there are many things that we as journalists, I mean, we studied, we, we know how to write, we know how to report. We don't know how to um, set up a company in another, in another country, let alone taxes, uh, migration costs, planes, you name it. And so if we had this space where I could, I could talk to my colleagues and ask, do you know someone? How, how, how do you do it? Um, so we, we started with the idea of making a podcast. We said, we'll just talk about everything we know. Hopefully someone will find it useful. So we, um, we built the Nemo podcast, also our first time doing a podcast, nerve wracking, but also great. <laughs> Um, so we hope that uh, if you look for the Nemo podcast on Spotify, you can um, listen to stories of other Excel media outlets, among us included, but also people who we have met and we have heard their stories and we think other media outlets should really know about this experience to get ideas and get inspired. Um, and we also have a website, Exile, uh, dot media. Dot media. So this is where we're going to share content and hopefully talk to more people who want to share um, um, their experiences and their tips, etc., to make to build a community and to exchange tips and to exchange um, anecdotes or you name it that may help someone even not quit journalism, mm -hmm. because this is one of the greatest challenges that you have when you go into exile that you are faced with situations and questions about can I actually continue when I don't know a language, et cetera. You guys may have known these stories. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help others so that they don't go through it alone. Thanks. And we're calling it Nemo because it's the network of Excel Media Outlets. And sitting here are the five members, the, cur the current five members of the network. And Matt, do you want to talk briefly about the network itself? And then we can go into Q&A. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I mean, um, Cynthia and Sudeshan already kind of summed it up. Um, it kind of happened a bit organically because they were already in contact with each other. And we at Maidan had had some connections to Zamane, just bumped into each other in the past few times, had exchanged emails. Um, so, and I was by myself also frustrated and trying to think of, uh, thinking pretty much of, yeah, we're spending money trying to solve all these problems that I don't like. I don't understand cyber stuff that well, so maybe there's someone who will help me there. And who's the best person to ask? I thought, oh well, Zamane is also Exile Media, and I reached out to them, and that's when we we all met. So then I was introduced to Sudeshna and then to 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 Cynthia, and we were you we were talking about doing a podcast, or we were we are still talking about starting a network. Um, so I guess we did do both. Um, because we did the oh, podcast, but we also <laughs> wanted to have this network to to share amongst each other um, in a space where also we're not competing with each other. You know, we are coming, we ha and we have totally different experiences. Um, a lot of overlap um, because we learned about Daniel Ortega's <laughs> wife and Ilham Aliyev's wife, who are vice presidents of of the Nicaragua and Azerbaijan. So even there, there's kind of overlap um, in the systems and the way things are working. But it's. Uh, that we see that actually it's also an opportunity for us to think ahead, you know, um, what's happening in, in Iran now could happen in Russia later, right? So, or the other way around. And so we are prepping ourselves and we're thinking of risks that we didn't think of before because our current context didn't have them. Um, but all of the governments they've got that are, you know, that are in charge of the, they've got money and, you know, 
<laughs> they're ready to spend it to crack down on, on, on journalism, on media, on civil society. So they're going to find these tools. Um, so this is, the idea is a space for us to, yeah, I mean, as you said, it's, it's to, to really strengthen each other and, and, and fight back. It's, I, was, I wrote this, yes. Because, yes, I, I have this, uh, yeah, because I was thinking it's, it's our, uh, I mean, like, we're all not there. We are mostly administrators, I, and I speak to the three of us especially, like, we're not from the countries, but these journalists, they risk so much, um, and they're, they're, they're the forefront for the fight for freedom of speech. And they're the forefront for the fight for, for journalism. And I get emotional every time I talk about this. Um, but it's, it's so important for us to fight back um, in every single way we can. So this is, is, is it's, it's, it's about sharing the knowledge with each other and also about not being competitors and, and, and forgetting about the competition even for funds or whatever. Because if, you know, if, if we're helping each other, um, together we're gonna, you know, the, the idea is that we're broken down. So there are, there are global threats against journalism and global, global I mean, connections amongst these dictators um, that are clamping down on everything and, oh, we have 10 minutes, okay, I thought five. Uh, and, 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 and so, yeah, let's fight back, let's, let's also band together, you know? Um, it doesn't have to be super bureaucratic, it doesn't have to have, you know, um, this huge organization or something, it's about really being effective. So, yeah, that's, that's my so. Q&A. Q&A. Well, we'll do the q and I'm not going to uh, wrap this up because I don't think anyone can do more justice to this panel than what Matt has already done. So we'll move on to the question and answer if there are any. Uh, sorry, I missed the, the, the briefing part, so please do tell me what to do with this. Someone brings a mic? Yes. Okay. Um, hi. My name is uh, Halima Salat. I am with Lighthouse Reports. Um, I was wondering, uh, I haven't heard you talk, guys talk about the role of the diaspora from your countries and if they are um, engaging with your content and how, if they are also like um, maybe helping you out or fundraising or, you know, participating in any way. Great, it's a great question indeed. I, I, I should have <laughs> spoken about it. Uh, diaspora are a really important uh, part also in, uh, in our work. Uh, uh, Burmese are, are, I think, fourth or fifth uh, diaspora in the world. For, it's the longest running civil war in the world, so there's many refugees throughout the years. And uh, the, actually, in con contrary to Ukraine, uh, the, the resistance in Myanmar doesn't get any international uh, financial support. And this Burmese diaspora all around the world are actually fundraising all the time, and they are funding their, their rebel uh, uh, the, yeah, the resist, resistance against the junta. So we are in, in a lot of uh, contact with them, and actually um, DVB, uh, yeah, we have also become diaspora ourselves. Uh, actually, now we're based in six different countries around the world, in uh, in Australia, in Norway and uh, uh, America, Canada, and Thailand, because our people had to go and the UNHCR uh, helped them uh, uh, flee to these countries. It's not that it was a really thought out plan, it's just how, how, uh, how it went. But um, so in these different countries around the world, we are also interviewing a lot of uh, diaspora. And of course, we have also been thinking, uh, like Cynthia said, about, uh, about uh, membership and, and that could also be a, a fundraising uh, uh, thing, but honestly, yeah. What what we see is that if if uh, people are raising funds, it is um, much more for the you know for the for the armed battle against this uh, junta, and not so much for uh, the media. So that is that is a bit difficult uh, a question uh, to ask. But yeah, we, we do uh, also serve uh, a diaspora, and uh, yeah, we see it on our our uh, uh, social media, also with our analytics, where our figures come from. And uh, like 85% of our views is coming from inside the country. And the rest is from, uh, it's, it's all, yeah, most of it is in Burmese. It's from all around, around the world. So these must be Burmese that are living uh, there. So that, that's hoping, answering a bit of your question. 
Yeah, and the reason why I asked is because I, I would have a follow-up question um, in regards to, and Cynthia touched a little bit on it. Um, the, I mean, people move for different reasons, and so journalists themselves sometimes um, move and uh, uh, move to a new, uh, like for example, I am originally from Kenya, and now I live in the Netherlands. Um, I try to get back into journalism, it's very, very difficult. So in, in a sense, um, and you guys are very inspiring, I get emotional now. Um, what kind of advice would you give, for example, um, individual journalists um, who have moved and migrated and how they can navigate this, this kind of maybe scene, I don't know. Um, I hope it's clear, the question. Yeah, it is, it is a good question, and it, it is, if I may answer shortly for DVB, I'm sure everybody has another answer, but uh, um, yeah, it, it is, of course, to be honest, it is complicated. Um, DVB used to be based in, in Myanmar, and it, it is, has already for a long time been one of the poorest countries, but of, of course we want to pay fair local salaries to our journalists, um, and Thailand, in that sense, is also more affordable from a point of view of, of you know, paying all the bills, but having people working from Australia and America and, the, and Canada and, and Norway, the most expensive country in the world, I guess, um, yeah, we pay them also a fair journalist salary in these countries, but for our total budget, that is really, really heavy. You know, so on the, on the longer term now, we are actually next week opening our new uh, headquarters in uh, Thailand, which we're really happy about, and we are, we call it recentralizing uh, back to to uh, Thailand um, for yeah a very uh, you know it is close to Myanmar of course and it's there's a lot of uh, uh, people coming in and out and we can also uh, uh, give them a training and uh, other support but uh, it is you know I would say if you uh, as a journalist would like to work for a Kenyan uh, uh, media maybe as a freelancer you could uh, uh, like uh, try to get your pieces sold. To, to media, but it is, yeah, it, is, it is a complicated thing, especially based on in which countries people are, are uh, living and the living costs, uh, if it is affordable. Yeah. I just want to say, I would say one thing about that just is, um, you know, we can't help with that, but we might know people who do. So, like, we're happy to also just use our networks to point people in the right direction, because um, we don't, no, but there are there is organizations out there that do assistance in different ways. So, yeah, like there's an info email as well, and we're here. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Luke Johnson. I'm a Berlin-based journalist covering Russian Eastern Europe and author of the Public Sphere newsletter. My question is on audience: Do you see yourself as speaking to? Uh, the people remaining in your country primarily, or do you see, like many of you come from countries where there's been significant out-migration, uh, you know, since the time of political crisis in Russia it started, well, it didn't start, but, you know, the acute phase started in 2012. Um, for instance, do you see your audience as sort of the people who were in the country, you know, before the, uh, the war or the crackdown started, or sort of, are, are you speaking to, uh, you know, uh, an audience that, that remains in the country? Because those two are, you know, very different uh, groups of people. Thanks. Um, it, it's funny because we just discussed this topic before um, this panel between us. Um, there is one, I think, fundamental idea behind every media in exile. Every media in exile tries to work for its uh, motherland or fatherland. Uh, every media tries to be as you know, relevant as possible for the people that stayed you know, there. And, um, but of course, we are, this is, you know, media in exile is a phenomenon. It's really interesting how it develops. For example, uh, Medusa uh, always had the, the majority of readers are in Russia, but we have like 30 to 40, maybe now more than 40 percent of our readers are based outside of the country, and they're like diverse between different, dispersed between different countries. 
And it's, it's important, it's interesting how to interact with this audience. We think that it's a really important part of our audience. However, we are, you know, stick to this idea that we need to work for the people inside. And I think we all share the same perception. Um, in, in the case of Nicaragua, what we discover is that there was an interest uh, from our audiences who have migrated to the United States, Costa Rica, etc., to see themselves reflected in the coverage. So what we did, um, uh, I think two years ago, was to create a project for migrants so that they could see not only the problems that the community is facing, but also um, the triumphs of the community. There's a lot of you know, it's a traumatic process. You have to go through a mourning process in which you have to accept that you're not going to be in your country anymore or for a very long time. And I think that project has been very positively, positively sorry, <laughs> welcomed. Um, so uh, in, in the case of, of Confidencial, we're trying to serve people in and out so that we don't forget that Nicaraguans are also trying to thrive in the countries that have welcomed them um, during the crisis. Thanks. Um, we'll take one more question, but I also want to say that we're all here, so please, if we are unable to take your question in the panel right now, find us outside, corner us here, and ask all your questions. We're more than happy to talk. Um, I found it really interesting what you taught about the network. If I would be a donor, I'm not a donor, unfortunately. <laughs> But if I would be a donor and give you 100,000 euro for the network, what would you do with that? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> we said, we, we, we told each other we should discuss this probably because we might get this question. Yeah. Did we discuss it? No. <laughs> so what are the main pain points? What, uh, you know, is really necessary for the next steps? I, I, I'll start and then you guys can take yeah. over from there. Um, I think at least for to to for now what we would like to understand is what does the ecosystem need what does the exile media landscape need now is what in what form we can get that information I'm not sure we haven't gotten to that part yet but I think a lot of times also one of the reasons we did this with a very grassroots mindset was because we, we said we don't want this to be top down we don't want the an agenda to to drive where Nemo goes we want a this trend. to be we don't want, a trend. We don't want it to be <laughs> a trend um, we want we want it to come naturally. We want to know what what do we need. So let's first start with the five of us. Let's see how we are able to help each other, support each other, and then from there keep growing. So I think one of the first things that we'd like to do is understand the landscape and understand what the landscape needs. Yeah. Plus, may I add just very shortly, we are launching these uh, podcasts, and I hope you are gonna listen to them and also give us feedback. And yeah, uh, I would say if there's going to be more uh, funding, we would like to make more podcasts also. Definitely. <laughs> I think we're done. I think we're done. So, I think we're done. Yeah. so thank, thank you. We'll talk. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, my name is Pavel uh, Kanigin. I'm from an independent media outlet to be continued. And uh, uh, so, uh, for exile, for for our media in exile, it's uh, uh, we are hugely rely on uh, free access to the internet. And in our countries, we know that our that the regimes try to shut it down. Try to shut down the access to the internet, they, they, they shut down Facebook, Instagram, they are about to shut down in Russia, YouTube. And uh, my question is, uh, do you think that we can uh, join our efforts in order to push 
big tech in order to come up with some technical solutions that will help us circumvent, you know, uh, the efforts of the, our regimes to uh, 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 to block the uh, access to the in to the internet and to so social platforms that we are hugely rely on. Uh, occasionally, I'm working on it uh, at the moment. Like I think it's uh, it's very important. We need to create this agenda. We need to talk to tech uh, companies and explain h how important uh, their input can be uh, crucial. I guess. Uh, and uh, when we talk, for, for example, let's take Russia, okay? Russia is, uh, has a sophisticated uh, system of, uh, uh, you know, regulation of internet. And Russia is not the pioneer of the internet regulation, right? But it's, it learns so good. And we know that it works closely, for example, with Chinese comrades. Uh, you know, and Russia can export technologies Russia can export regulations of internet. And uh, now we consider this problem as a regional, but this problem can become global. It means that we need to talk to tech people and explain it to them. Let's do it. This is just our work. We have to do it. Thank you.